great stuff. I think we should kick off. Like I said, we've got a good bunch of content to get through today. So thank you for joining us today, uh, wherever you're joining us from. Welcome um, to a Patch My PC webinar. We try to hold these um, as often as we can, um, just to maybe share some of the, the stuff we know around specific technologies that we use uh, and our customers use. And the cloud management gateway seemed like a very good topic. Uh, when we talk to our customers, we sometimes see misconfigurations or misunderstandings of what that technology is and how the CMG can help you in your organization. So hopefully today um, we'll go through and maybe dispel some myths, maybe share something you didn't know, um, maybe just reinforce your existing understanding of the CMG. So it's good to have you all here. Um, Let's give some introductions before we kick off. So my name is Ben. Um, I'm an engineer here at Patch My PC. Uh, I've been here for seven months. Uh, love the place, love the people, love the technology. Uh, yeah, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today as one of the hosts. Uh, and uh, my name is Cody Mathis. I'm an engineer here at Patch My PC as well. I've uh, been here about three years and uh, keeps me busy. Keeps me on top of my toes. Love it. I'm Jake Shackerford, also an engineer here at Patch My PC. Um, as a side note, you'll notice chat is disabled. So if you do have a question, head over to Q&A. Um, and we'll try to get everything that you have uh, answered. We'll hopefully have some time at the end. Also allow you to come off mute if you've got any other questions. But yeah, thanks for coming. Awesome. So let's, let's get started. Uh, let's talk about the cloud management gateway. Um, maybe we can do a show of hands. I don't know whether I can accurately see the response, but who is actually using a CMG in their organization today? Those config managed customers. I imagine, well, especially with COVID, right? Um, the, yeah. the number of CMGs in the world probably uh, exploded. There's a lot of thumbs up and a lot of hands going up. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I remember the, the last organization I was working at, um, we we were moving to cloud, but we weren't quite there. And the CMG was a technology that helped us rapidly get going, you know, able to manage our devices on the internet, deploy software, make sure we're deploying updates as well. So really good technology. <clears throat> so let's go through some of the stuff we've got here today. Are the slide sharing okay? Can you see me skip to the next slide? Yeah, it looks so I don't want to get half an hour into the meeting and find out you haven't <laughs> seen anything. You like what's Ben talking about? <laughs> yeah, so I'd say um, kind of a couple of housekeeping things, like Jake alluded to. Uh, you know, we we do have chat disabled right now. Uh, we do have the Q and A function enabled. Definitely feel free to to go ahead and use that. Um, we're we're going to be bouncing around here a little bit. You know, we're going to answer <clears> some questions. We've got some slides. We've got some labs. A um, couple things that always get asked that we can address up front, and I'm sure it might still come up. Yes, it's recorded. Um, yes, we're going to post it on YouTube for sure. Uh, and yes, we will share the slide deck. So those are all three things you can definitely be sure of. And that's something we, I think, always do on our webinars because uh, um, hopefully that's good content and uh, it's useful to people after the fact too. Yeah, great point. And and to that point as well, we, um, we have got a, a few slides in this webinar only because we think it's useful. Some of the information we share, like tips and tricks and gotchas, we just think it's useful to have it on a deck. Um, yeah, so that's the reason we've got a few slides. So we're going to jump through the slides fairly quickly. We like to get to the fun stuff and go in the lab and just show you what's going on behind the scenes. Um, but we think this might be valuable. So today, in the next hour and a half or so, we're going to talk about the CMG. So at a kind of a high level, uh, what is a CMG? What is a cloud management gateway? Uh, we'll take a look at some of the components um, that are used to build that solution. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time around authentication. That's one of the <coughs> big areas we see some confusion. Look at um, this. So, so are you using certificates? Are you using EHTTP? Maybe you've got internet connected devices that are in tune and rolled as your AD joined, and you're thinking, well, can I still use a CMG to authenticate? And so we'll go through some of those options. Um, and like I said a few minutes ago, looking at some known configuration gotchas. So when our customers contact us and say, hey, look, um, software's not installing, we can maybe help them uh, with some of the common scenarios we see. So we'll point those out. 
then like i said we'll jump into the lab <clears throat> uh, we found out some really cool stuff ourselves as we've been um, looking at the cmg and maybe at the end we'll have a bit of time for q a and some further thinking around what do we do with updates moving forwards so what is a cmg for those who haven't used it the cmg as a concept was introduced by microsoft back in uh, 1802 i think i think as a so, preview yeah. just before 1802. Um, and at a very high level, it's a proxy service for your management point and software update point. So your clients don't have to be on internal infrastructure or a VPN to communicate with config man. Um, Microsoft obviously realized that clients were moving out and about. People weren't sitting on a desk in front of a computer behind a firewall. The world was changing. People were moving around with their devices, but hey, we still need to manage them. We need to make sure that we can manage those devices and patch them. So in comes the cloud management gateway. So at a very high level, the clients that are out on the internet or on a uh, different network can connect into the management point and the software update point specifically um, yep. to get policy and software updates. And there's, you know, precursors to this, right? Uh, there is the the IBCM uh, scenario. So there was other ways to manage mm. internet based devices uh, pre CMG, but CMG is kind of the more convenient way. There are still some scenarios for IBCM. Uh, not really something we'll cover so much in here, uh, but you know, this was not the first iteration of cloud based management for config man, but it's certainly the most convenient. Um, I think there was kind of a joke that initially, right? It was three clicks or something like CMG is so easy um or whatever it is and so it only took us 46 slides to, to boil it down so shouldn't shouldn't take too long yeah i think code management was five clicks and cmg was three clicks something, something, something like, like that. that um but yeah and I, I mean we we talk about cmg being useful for those internet-based clients but also we see customers using it for dmz's mm -hmm. so maybe you don't want to if you've got your dmz and you, you don't want to break open the firewall to your internal network you can definitely have those servers or clients in the DMZ reaching out to a CMG for content instead. Um, so lots of use cases. We'll try and pick through some of those as we go through the slides. Um, so let's let's move on. <clears throat> so we've covered some of the scenarios that this is useful for. So roaming devices on the internet. Branch offices, this is a good one. Um, so if you have VPNs today that connect your remote offices together, they can be expensive and they can be slow. Um, so the CMG offers an alternative solution. So instead of having your config man distribution points pushing content out over VPs on an expensive WAN, um, just have that local office connected to the internet and get those clients to use the CMG. Definitely a great use case. Um, mergers and acquisitions, really cool uh, use case for a CMG. So Again, we don't have to join devices to a domain in order to pull content from com your config manager distribution points. Um, we can definitely have Azure AD join devices. Um, there are some prerequisites to that um, with hybrid identities, but we can certainly have those internet-born devices pulling content from a CMG. We'll talk about those scenarios. And the last one on this slide was the, the one I pointed out earlier was DMZ devices. Yeah, the uh, the available actions, I think, is a really good point. So there are some limitations, um, but uh, even with the limitations in mind, the list of things you can do via a CMG in Configuration Manager is really the core components of what you'd want to do, right? Um, you, you can you can do a lot of your um, BGB, your fast channel type things. So client status and notifications, you can still run CM pivot, you can use run scripts. Um, which is all awesome, right? That's your instant stuff, uh, more or less instant. And that can all be done via a CMG. Uh, and then on top of that, you can do all of your typical device management type tasks, software distribution, software updates, both third party and first party. Uh, and you do have some task sequence options. There is not currently any native way to, to serve up a boot image based task sequence, but you can do task sequences. Uh, so um, there is some limitations as well, but none of them are, I would say, too game breaking, really. Uh, we've got a link there, and so we will share out the slide deck. Um, but uh, an awesome thing to keep in mind, being able to do all this over the internet is is really amazing. Defo. And 
some of the things that are called out in the Microsoft docs that you cannot do with a CMG um, are listed here as well. Um, so if you have Max, this is a sad day for you. Um, <laughs> not currently supported across a CMG. Um, wake on LAN. That'd be interesting if your um, config manager admin could switch on your PC at home. Um, yeah, currently not supported. So I think it's good to call those out. So when we talk about a CMG, there are quite a few different components and moving parts to make the CMG work. <clears throat> so starting off with a graphic that we looked at on one of our initial slides, um, the CMG cloud service is the thing that lives up in Azure. So that's our cloud management gateway. And the best way to think of this service is a glorified reverse proxy. So your clients will talk to the cloud management gateway service in Azure and any requests for the management point or the software update point are proxied through to your on-premise infrastructure. So all of that communication goes through the cloud management gateway. And the cloud management gateway then will pass um, comms through to the CMG connection point. Um, so this provides the connection um, between the Azure service, the, C the cloud management gateway, and your config manager infrastructure. So from here, the CMG connection point forwards all requests from the CMG through to your management point and software update point. The service connection point is interesting. It, it kind of just sits there and monitors the service for health and handles some of the deployment tasks as well for the CMG. And we'll dig into that in a bit more detail later. And ultimately, all of these moving parts together help your clients contact your management point and software update point. So the software update point, for those who maybe um, aren't too sure what that role is, um, that is what your clients will connect to, to typically in an on-premise network, download Microsoft updates and third-party updates. There's some interesting things to look out for. When we talk about um, Microsoft updates, particularly um, when using a CMG, uh, we have to change our mindset slightly. So in, in a typical environment on-premise using Config Manager, You've got WSUS, you've got your software update point, um, you, you're scanning WSUS, pulling content down, um, distributing content. When your clients are coming through a CMG, there isn't a requirement for you to distribute Microsoft update content to your CMG. OK, and we'll, we'll go through that in a bit more detail as well as we move through the slides. And if you want to add anything to that, Cody, this early on around. Yeah content. I mean, it's Not essentially so. at a high level. Um, your your clients, when they're pulling updates down, when they're scanning against the CMG, will pull that content across the CDN for Microsoft updates. Um, Not quite the same story for third party updates. So one of the gotchas that we see um, for third party updates is people not distributing the content to their cloud management gateway. Because the cloud management gateway is kind of a two part service. You have that proxy service that the clients talk to. And you also have the storage part of the service as well. So content is actually stored yeah. um, in the cloud management gateway. And that's something we can show it too. And we uh, will pull up Azure and we'll show these components and you can see the bits and pieces that make up a CMG. Yeah, definitely. So what does it look like? Let's jump into a lab at this point, shall we? Do some sharing. Okay, let me... Do you want to share or do you need to share this one, Cody? Um, I think you could take this one. Yeah, you know, because okay. you've got the PKI scenario, so we can show that. Yeah. Up. So just let me know when you can see. I've shared out my remote desktop screen. Can you see that? Okay. I can. Awesome. So if we're in Config Manager, um, we head over to the Administration tab, Cloud Services. Let's minimize some of this to keep it clean. And then Cloud Management Gateway over here on the left hand side. Um, here's one we prepared earlier, but I'm just going to show you what the wizard would look like if you were to create one from scratch. Now, I'm, I'm assuming that um, a lot of customers already have the CMG set up. Um, this, this webinar is still useful if you haven't got one set up. So um, there are some pitfalls when you run through the initial wizard that we're going to cover as well. So this is still useful. Um, but typically, I'll create the Cloud management gateway from config manager. So I'd sign in to my tenant. 
and pick a subscription. So that's the first thing I do. And when we talk about configuring a cloud management gateway, um, we, we need to specify a couple of things straight off the bat. We need to provide the cloud management gateway with a certificate. Because if you think about it, the cloud management gateway is in the cloud. It's a proxy service. Our clients are on the internet and they're going to connect to it. And we want that communication to be secured. We don't want it going over HTTP. So we're typically going to say to the cloud management gateway, here's a certificate. Use this certificate to secure comms um, to the clients that are speaking to you. And um, I think when we jump back into the slides, we're going to talk about you know what kind of certificate you should use and some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages of like using a public certificate or a public uh, internal PKI. Yeah. Um, so we 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 need to choose a certificate, and the important thing is when we when we look to generate the certificate, it's the common name on the certificate which is going to dictate the DNS name of our cloud service. Okay, so if I look yeah. at so Sorry, when you look you at the uh, that? yeah, the only thing that comes yeah. to mind with the cert and the common name too, there's two ways actually to go about this. Um, you do have the option to set up an alias, like a C name, um, and so it can look nice. You know, you can have something that's like cmg.company.com, um, and and the docs do kind of recommend that. Uh, in our lab scenarios that we're showing here, um, you know, I don't think we have any C name set up or anything, so we're we're just using um, you know name dot and then region dot cloud app dot azure dot com. Um, so but you do have an option to to use something nice and pretty if you do go and get a cert for it and a C name for it. Yeah, I use something nice and pretty in my lab. So oh, I good. use yeah. <laughs> That's fancy. So I did an absolutely spot on. If if you want to use um like I've used in one of my labs um this is one of the, my test domains by Ben dot com and I've actually create a C name um, in DNS. So any traffic that points to CMG by Ben lab by Ben dot com is actually going to be redirected to my cloud management gateway service in Azure. And so okay. one of the things we're going to go point out is that this name here has to be unique. Across all of Azure too, I think that's the big thing. Yeah, certainly the region because when I think it's region um, mm -hmm. be because in the old days when CMG first came out, um, they used to use um, classic compute and classic compute. Anything you had exposed to that on the Internet as a public DNS name would end in um, oh, what was the name? Uh, CloudApp.net, I think, was the mm. domain they used for Microsoft. Um, but now they're using a virtual machine scale set in Azure. I think that came in with Config Man 2107. And so these DNS names changed as well. Um, so de depending on what region you select um, further down here will depend on this this name. So let me let me start the wizard up again. Sign into a tenant. We do have a few questions if um I want to take some of them real quick while you're yeah. bringing that up. Yeah, sure. Uh, do we? I don't know Kurt, who. Looks like Kurt has their hand up first. So uh, come on, if you want, Kurt. Uh, I do see a question about e HTTP enough, or do we need HTTPS? Um, which is, I think, a good thing to kind of answer um, generally. Uh, we'll cover both mm -hmm. EHTTP and EHTTPS throughout these slides and presentation. So both are supported. Yeah, sure. So I just wanted to point out to depending depending on the region. Um, so this is going to be something that gets spun up in Azure. So ideally pick a region close to you so your clients can reach it fairly quickly. Um, mm -hmm. Azure is quite fast, but Microsoft still recommend picking a region close to you. So. Um, yeah, the, the deployment name will be whatever we specify on the common name on the certificate. So the, the both need to match. Um, and this, the common name that you use, this FQDN has to be unique across um, that region. And so one of the things I've seen before is a, a, a customer would say, right, 
Um, I'm going to have this name. I'm going to maybe have um, Ben's book sale dot west europe dot cloud app dot azure dot com that's going to be the name of my cmg service so the go and order a certificate for ben's book sale dot west europe dot cloud app dot azure dot com or or even for their sorry they won't get the they won't order a certificate for the azure dot com they would order the certificate for their own domain and have that c name in place and they go and import the certificate in this wizard and find out that that name was already taken i was like man i've just wasted all that money on a certificate um, so there are things you can do and places you can check to understand whether that name is free. Maybe I can show those now. Is that a good point? Show yeah, that. it couldn't hurt. Yeah. So there's there's three places you need to do this. So if you go into Azure uh, and the first thing you want to do is search for public IP address. Yeah, we and do we cover to... this in the slide too, I will say. We've got these three sections just as a back reference. Yeah. So we create a public IP address and we give it a name. So let's call this um, Ben's new CMG. Ben's new CMG. And DNS label. Let's call this um, CMG by Ben Lab dot com. We pick US East. And what uh, it's telling me. Sorry, is it need.com? Yeah, sorry, good call out. So it's telling me that this name is not available. It's already taken. So if I was to try and create my cloud service with this name, it would fail during the creation. So I can come and here just to check whether it's available. I don't need to reserve it here. I can just use this to check if it's free. And there's two more things you need to check as well because the CMG service um, also consists of an Azure Key Vault. So you'd also want to come into here, search for Key Vaults and see if you can create a Key Vault with the same name. So if I go cre create, uh, let's pick any resource group, Key Vault name, CMG by Ben Lab. Again, it's telling me that's in use. So this is the name of the service I already have in my lab. There, look. So that's in use. If I was to specify a different one, it's going to say, hey, yeah, that's free. Go for it. And the other place you need to check, so public IP address, key vault, and you also need to check whether you can create a storage account with the same name as well. I'm glad Azure's working now. There's an, there was an issue earlier. <laughs> this this would have been more difficult to show earlier. So it CMG, Pipe Ben Lab, East US. No, that's taken. I can create it in a different region because in a different region, it's going to be um, a different name. So that's cool. I just thought that'd be useful to point out at this stage. Yeah, for sure. Um, so once once the service is set up, what does it look like in Azure? So let's go back into Azure again. So you can dump this whole service into an existing resource group, or as you're going through the wizard, you can specify it to create a new resource group for you. So if I search for resources, here's the resource group that I created for my CMG that is running. And we've got a few different things in here. So we've got a virtual machine scale set. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail as well later. We've got a key vault. Um, we've got a load balancer because you can have more than one VM instance for your CMG, um, depending on the size of your organization. Um, so we, if we're going to have more than one instance, um, we're going to want to proxy that to share the load out across our VMs. And we also have a network security group as well, which is pretty useful. Yeah, um, for sure. And I think, because um, <laughs> I know we're going to end up bouncing back and being a little jumbled on slides. Mm. While we're here, do we actually want to show the app registrations as a component of Azure here? Because we've got the app registrations for off. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, good call. 
So we have some services running in Azure, but there's also some app registrations as well that handles um, security and authentication between the CMG service and Config Manager as well. Um, so if we have a look in here, these are the two app registrations that were created when I went through the wizard initially. Um, I didn't call them very good names, and it doesn't really matter <laughs> what you call them. Um, but essentially, you'll see those two services within your Azure Active Directory. And one of them uh, does actually have a, it has a secret key. Uh, and oh. I think a good a good thing to, to note is that that key can and will expire. Uh, I don't remember the version they added it, but the council now notifies you of the expiration. I think their alert bar will even pop up and it'll tell you, hey, you've got client apps with a secret that is about to expire. Uh, so we can see here it is. It's going to expire, you know, January 24th of 2026. So we've got some time, um, but this will absolutely uh, break your CMG at the end of the day yeah. when that expires. And the good thing you, as well is you can update that key from Config Man as well. You don't have to go mm -hmm. to Azure. If you did update it in Azure, you just need to update application settings here so that that information is synchronized, but you can totally renew it here. It'll just prompt you for your GA credentials. Yeah, so... No magic going on. They just have a couple of app registration, and that's kind of what's making the connection between your environment and Azure actually possible in this case. Yeah, just while we're here as well, just before we jump back into the slides, we were just going to go through these settings. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in this instance here in my CMG, this was a unique name that I could choose um, for Azure. So I created a CNAME certificate in my DNS for cmgbytebenlab.byteben.com to map to this domain. So this is interesting as well. When you're setting up the CMG, you kind of need to have a consideration for how big your environment is. So because this is just a lab, um, I've chosen the VM size to be a B2, uh, which is adequate for around 10 CMG clients. It's very slow hardware. I um, certainly wouldn't want to use that in production. Um, you'd maybe be looking at an A2 size virtual machine, which is adequate for around 6,000 client connections. Um, the other option you have is for an A4. Obviously, as you um, increase the power of these virtual machines, um, your cost will go up, and we'll talk about costs later as well, because this is an Azure consumption service. Uh, the A4 V2 will handle around 10,000 clients. Um, if you have more than 10,000 clients, um, you maybe want to increase the number of, number of instances that are available. And so. This is the virtual machine scale set. So this would create four virtual machines behind the load balancer in Azure. So as my connection requests come into the CMG, um, they would be shared out fairly across those four VM instances. So it's pretty cool stuff. You could even consider like if you want some kind of high availability um, with your CMG, maybe having a couple. Um, but typically Azure is fairly highly available anyway. Um, so that's a decision you need to make on how many VMs you want to spin up there. Cool. OK, I think we should jump back into the slides now. That was good just to jump in there and show that. Mm -hmm. Let me share back the slides again. See if we can pick a few of these questions that have their hands up. Yeah, yeah Joseph, can get um, yeah. feel free to hop off of mute. Joseph? Hmm. I think we can hear you. Yeah, I, I accidentally raised my hand. Sorry about that. No problem. Let's see, uh, David Gardner? I have a question at this point. Uh, I'm raising my hand. All right. Uh, let's see, Linton Matthew. Or let's see. I did see somebody that just raised their hand, Michael Perez. If you do have a question, feel free. Just because we saw you just pop mm -hmm. on. So, what do you got? If you needed to redo the app registration mm -hmm. part, 
could you because like you had deployed an older version of the CMG, mm-hmm. could you just redo that part, or would it be better just to do redo the whole thing as an as a new ser, uh, CMG service? So you yeah, can that's... reuse existing app registrations. There's no harm in doing that. Um, that component hasn't really changed historically. Um, it would more so be if you wanted to stand up a new CMG to move from the the classic compute to the 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 newer you know scale set uh, type. Uh, is that kind of the scenario you're talking about? Yeah, that's a scenario. But also, um, they said there's a incorrect uh, reply URL in in oh, the okay. database, and they wanted us to update that. But my lead doesn't want to do direct edits in the database, so we're looking that's at fair. just moving to a VM scale set, anyways. Mm-hmm. There's no harm in, in just making new app registrations at that point. Then they're 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 pretty they're pretty harmless. And once you know it works, just decom everything else. Yeah, yeah, you okay. can't because the the original classic compute is on the cloudapp.net domain. They, they mm-hmm. you can't move it to a virtual machine scale set instance. It is literally build some build a new CMG and plan for that accordingly. Um, They've got the little migrate option, um, but it, it really just builds a new one with all your config. Yeah, and that option is sometimes grayed out. And if you do see it grayed out, it's an optional feature that you need to enable uh, within updates and services in Config Man. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I had a quick one, uh, real quick. Um, do you need a PKI to actually uh, do the CMG? No, that is a scenario we will cover for sure. So there is no yeah. requirement at all. You can do all of this without a PKI. Uh, there are some requirements if you don't have a PKI, uh, but totally doable. Um, and that's something well, my lab actually is, mine's ha- closer to that scenario than Ben's is right now. Um, I- I'm one start away from not using PKI just because I didn't want to buy a public cert. Um, so we can show <laughs> that. Okay, and the, do the clients need to be using PKI? No, no. Finds themselves no requirement fine. at all. No mm-hmm. requirement at all. Okay. Um, <laughs> one, one other question. Uh, let's say if you had a cloud distribution point set up, but you mm-hmm. want to migrate that CDP over to a CMG, um, would that just be a whole new setup? I know the cloud distribution point is a separate tab. Yeah. C- C- I don't okay. think there's any migration. That's just straight up stand up CMG and get rid of your CDP when you're done. Cool. Yeah, nice. something. <clears throat> The, the point around like going from classic compute to virtual machine scale set, I didn't see it in my lab, but I've got a feeling they did have a feature where you could do a convert. They um, do. There were, the, the trouble is, though, I did see some people when they did the convert, things broke, and that's because some of the prerequisites weren't met. So yeah. certainly if, if you are in that situation where you're looking to a conversion, there's some things if you look at the Microsoft Docs prereq-wise, certainly have a look at what um, resources you've got enabled on your subscription. So make sure you've enabled Key Vault, storage, yeah. compute. Um, and we'll show some, those actually at the end. We've got a yeah. slide that covers those because they actually got me in my lab um, because they I could. was running my, you know, exactly that. So yeah. Yeah. OK, th- thank you. Yep. Good stuff. Awesome. OK, so we're going to rattle, rattle through authentication. Um, this is really important, and this is where things could go wrong. And so we hear all these like, acronyms like EHTTP, PKI, um, SMS tokens. Uh, what does it all mean? So we're going to go through some of the options, um, but this is something you really want to plan carefully and get right. And this will be different for everybody. Like If you've got a PKI, maybe you want to continue using a PKI. Um, if you're not using HTTPS yet on your management points, um, maybe you want to use the HTTP. That's quite simple. Or maybe you just want to, all of your machines, you're just warning them again, you in, in June in Azure, and you want to use Azure AD authentication instead. Um, and that's totally fine as well. So when we talk about authentication, the, the first thing we need to think about was the CMG server authentication certificate, which we kind of alluded to when we went in the lab just now. So we'll have a quick discussion around that. Um, the next part of the authentication is how we do the Azure Active Directory integration, which kind of happens when you go through the wizard to create the CMG, but it's very important to help authenticate um, those Azure AD users and hybrid identities. Um, so we'll talk a bit about that. And then we'll talk about client authentication options. How can my client authenticate? Do I have to have PKI? Can I use tokens instead? Can I use Azure AD identities? So let's step through each of those. <clears throat> the CMG server itself. 
uh, requires a certificate like we showed you. Uh, we need to generate a PFX file and import it during the wizard. So the question that always comes up is, well, what kind of certificate should I use? Should I use a certificate for my own internal PKI or should I use one from a public provider? Um, I think you had some thoughts around this, Cody, when we were talking about it earlier. Yeah, around. yeah, for sure. So uh, we, we do have, you know, the two scenarios actually in the our two labs right now. Uh, ben has P, uh, public and I have a PKI issued one. Um, you know, one of one of the big components of, of certs is trust. And one of the big components of trust is a certificate revocation list and, uh, and a point to actually check that CRL. So, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a public provider, uh, that CRL is it better be uh, available, right? Your clients are going to be yeah. able to check and say, is this certificate revoked? Has some has some authority actually said, don't trust this anymore? Um, and in a PKI, you have to maintain that. You have to make it public facing. So if, if you've got a PKI mm -hmm. infrastructure and your CRL is not in place and it's not publicly available, um, you know, you're, you're losing some of the value there from your certs and that sort of chain of authority. So that's a big thing to keep in mind is if you've got a well-maintained, um, you know, secure PKI infrastructure that has a, a, a functional CRL, cool. There, you know, maybe you would want to go ahead and, and use that. You may have some, um, you know, contractual obligations to not use certain public providers, things like that. Um, yeah. So that's a big consideration. And then also uh, when you use PKI, uh, your client or really either sort scenario, the client has to trust the cert chain of the cert. So mm -hmm. um, in, in Ben's lab right now, he's got a public cert. Um, it's a publicly trusted cert. It's widely used so that, you know, any client that does attempt to talk to the CMG says, oh, I know that cert provider. I trust it. It's in my trusted root certificate authorities and I've got the intermediate chain. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a PKI scenario, and this is my lab, um, where I have an internet facing client, it's never talked to the PKI ever. Um, and I'm actually using a PKI self-signed, not self-signed, I'm using a PKI cert. I had to import the root cert on the client, right? So um, one step further in my lab would be a, um, mine has never seen the domain. It's all Azure AD joined, no PKI at all. Then I use a public cert. You completely remove PKI from the, uh, you know, from the scenario entirely. It can be all EHTTP. It can be all Azure AD based off with tokens. Uh, it's kind of that, I guess, golden egg scenario where something has never even seen your infrastructure, but you can bring it in, uh, and we'll show how to do that later as well. Yeah, Defo, I'm I'm definitely a fan of like public provider here. Um, so mm -hmm. this is where I stick my flag in the sand. Like it's so much easier. Like Cody said, your clients will just natively trust that certificate. Um, hopefully, if the public yeah. provider is doing their job right. Um, yeah, much much easier. And also, Microsoft called this out in their docs, and I haven't really given it much time to test. But if if you're using um, internal PKI and you you're telling the CMG like just go and check the certificates the client is presenting, there is an overhead, and because there's an overhead in traffic, there's an overhead in data, and if there's an overhead in data, there's a cost associated with it. Um, so there are some things to consider, and we'll cover some of those when we talk about client certificates and PKI, but public yeah. providers certainly easier for the CMG certificate. And don't forget, all this certificate is doing is securing comms between your client and the CMG service. It's not, at this point, it's not um, authenticating your clients to your management points. Okay, so it's just that secure communication channel. <clears throat> okay, the other piece of the authentication puzzle that we needed to solve, which is done for us pretty much, we don't need to think about this too much, is how the, the CMG can authenticate users and devices um, on-prem. And this is where we looked at the different applications that we created as we went through the wizard. Uh, we had the server app created and the client app. And the client app rep represents the managed clients and users that try to connect to the CMG. And the server app um, is used to facil facilitate authentication and authorization for managed clients um, to the CMG connection point. Both apps are important. Both have a different role. One of them has a secret key associated with it, so don't let it expire. Um, but pretty much that's dealt with during the wizard. And we showed earlier that you can see those two app registrations in Compigman and make a comparison to those in um, in Azure. So as 
as you start to integrate your config man on prem to the cloud, you'll maybe see a few different app registrations appear. Maybe you've got one for tenant attach. So when you're naming these things, when you're going through the wizard, um, maybe give it something useful. Otherwise, when you're looking at Azure Active Directory tenants and you see these multiple app registrations in config man, you're like, well, what's that? I need to go and check the client ID and look at what permissions that app has to understand what app it is and what it's doing. <clears throat> um, so the kind of the flow, I think I'm going to skip through this fairly quickly, this slide. This is useful as a takeaway, so download the PowerPoint at the end. This just talks about how the Azure AD integration and authentication works. Yeah. Um, we've got a link there on the Microsoft page. We'll show a little bit of that um, stuff in the database and it's a little bit of the connection and token requesting later, but uh, this is honestly a good slide to understand the flow for sure. Yeah, it's really good, um, especially if you want to do those user cent centric tasks um, via a CMG, like distribute mm -hmm. software to a user rather than to a device. Um, so we need it needs to be a hybrid identity. We need to understand who the user is and do a match to them. So we can synchronize users from Azure AD. Um, they get put into the config man database. We can trust them. We can issue tokens. And Cody's going to jump into that in a bit more detail when we have a look at the labs as well. Uh, that's quite cool to see some of that stuff in SQL. Some of the stuff in the cloud. <clears throat> Uh, this is the bit we really wanted to focus on with client auth. OK, so what are the options for clients? So if you've got a PKI, by all means, carry on using that. That's absolutely fine. So this is how your client authenticates to the management point and distribution point, essentially. Um, so PKI is fine or EHTTP. Um, I think uh, a lot of people were using HTTP. Uh, Microsoft said, look, we need to move everything to HTTPS. And so in some customers, instead of making that investment in the in a brand new PKI, decided to go the EHTTP route. And it really is quite simple to set up. It's a few clicks on some of the role services in Config Man. Um, you used that in your lab, didn't you, Cody? How did you find it setting up EHTTP? Yeah. Literally four clicks. Not bad. Uh, it, yeah, EHTTP is, is very easy to set up. Uh, it, it's a super quick bridge to getting um, kind of the most important client communications to be secure. Uh, so at the end of the day, the way I like to describe it rudimentary any, anyway is um, it is still like self-signed, but it is signed by Config Man and your clients know to trust it. That's kind of what it boils down to. It's a little bit more than that, but at the end of the day, uh, your your config man acts as its own little PKI infra, and it tells your you know the client and all the config man interactions know uh, what's valid and not valid, and it can distribute out all those certs and set them up on all your bindings and everything. So it's magic. Uh, a, a fun thing to note is in the docs, uh, the first line in the enhanced HTTP doc is Microsoft recommends using HTTPS. Uh, so the first thing they say is don't use HTTP, e HTTP. Uh, but it is way easier and it is a massive, massive uh, win, I would say. It got a lot of people to be much more secure than they were without really having to make them do almost anything at all. Definitely. Yeah. It's... Um, Azure AD token. So your internet born devices and users can actually authenticate via a CMG um, using Azure AD integration. So we can use the management certificate on the device um, to request a token for that Azure AD user. And there's some prereqs around that, um, but that's that's really cool. Um, we're getting the trust from the device and the user. Um, yeah, I think. We didn't actually cover this in our labs, did we? This scenario, the Azure AD token um, authentication. Uh, or did you? No, we didn't no. because I used the site token. That's correct. <clears throat> um, but certainly if, if you've not got a PKI um, and you're heavily invested in cloud and you've, you're a config man house, um, certainly mm. look at what is involved around Azure AD token for authentication. Again, we call out the link later on for the docs. So certainly look at that first and see if that will fit your requirements. Um, pretty simple stuff to get started with. And then the, the, the other option we have, so we can have internet born devices. Maybe they don't have any client certificates at all and we want to reg them, register them into config man. Another way we can do that is by leveraging a bulk registration token. So this is something we can generate from our site server. We can generate a token that's short lived. Um, it's mighty powerful. 
And when we're doing CCM setup on those internet born clients, we can specify the bulk token, which gives the client just enough time to communicate with the management point with that token to then receive its own token from Config Manager for authentication moving forwards. So we're going to have a look at those different options here now. Client certificate first, <clears throat> typically issued from a PKI. Um, the CMG connection point needs to know that it trusts the client certificates issued from your PKI. So you would need to add the root certificate to your CMG connection point properties in Config Manager. Um, is that clear on that screen or do you want me to jump out? Trouble is if I jump to the lab, PowerPoint kind <laughs> of does a bit of a doozy. Um, so that's just one thing to call out, um, adding your root certificates in there. Yep. Uh, you don't need to add root certificates if you're not using PKI to your CMG. And that's if you're the using scenario of, I've got going right now. Cool. And what I might do later when we jump in the lab, um, I might actually break into the compute instance in Azure to show you the CMG. It's a reverse proxy, but it's just a Windows box. And we can actually see those root certificates that we add to the properties in Config Man. We can actually see that in the certificate store um, on our Azure instance. That's pretty fun. So we might do that a bit later. Uh, we called this out earlier, verified client certificate revocation. Uh, this yeah. is an option on your CMG. Um, if you do decide to do this and there's a requirement from your business to do this, uh, you must make sure that there is a certificate revocation point that is publicly available for your PKI. So typically you'd publish that over port 80 um, internally. If you're going to tick verify client certificate revocation, and the CMG is unable to find the CRP because uh, it's not public, then that will fail and your clients won't be able to communicate and you'll see lots of red lines in the logs. So just be wary if you tick in that box. This is your favorite, Cody. Do you want to talk about enhanced HTTP? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, we do have, you know, the enhanced HTTP option. Uh, so within the uh, site, itself when you uh, have the site properties there is actually uh, one step before that little uh, checkbox lights up uh, and the different roles and it's right there use config man generated certs for http site systems uh, so that ultimately lights up the ability to use e http and if you have any http roles like a dp um, or a mp um, it will automatically start using those enhanced HTTP setups. And then this is going to also let you do that non-PKI scenario, right? You can have no PKI infrastructure if you don't want or have one, and you can still use a CMG. You can still have clients out there on the internet that are talking to Configuration Manager. Yeah, it's great got its point. own set of prereqs. Um, also, this box to, to tell Config Manager um to use the http on the site that isn't lit up on the management point unless you configure it on the site so mm -hmm. if you don't tick this box to configure the http for your site um you then can't go on to the next stage and configure your management point for um, cloud management gateway traffic if you've got http selected and you haven't configured the http on your site this option is grayed out so that's one thing just to call out there. Yeah, for sure. OK, so some of the prereqs, if if you weren't using PKI and EHTTP, you're not so sure about, you're kind of cloud first. Um, Azure AD authentication is an option. Um, certainly go and read the docs to understand what is required from this standpoint. So the devices either need to be Azure AD joined or hybrid hybrid joined, so they're sy synchronized. Um, they need that workplace join certificate installed on the device um, to do their thing. The user also needs to have an identity in Azure so that we can issue it a token. Um, interestingly, this authentication method, Azure AD, is the only one that will allow um, user centric scenarios from Config Manager via the CMG. So like we said earlier, if you're deploying software to user groups or user collections, um, you're going to want to use uh, Azure AD authentication. But using client PKI, EHTTP, 
you're looking at kind of device actions across a CNG only. Um, the third point there just talks about kind of what happens, what needs to be in place for Azure AD authentication. So we talk about when a device is hybrid joined or Azure AD joined, they have that workplace join certificate installed. If that certificate is not present on the device, then we can't request Azure AD tokens for that user. Um, so we put a link on that slide as well to give you more information about that. Yeah, and uh, for our site token, this is the scenario that I actually used in my lab. Uh, so there is the ability to um, use a generate a token uh, for that initial configuration. Uh, so when you do the initial communication, right, like a cloud based client, uh, it doesn't have PKI. You don't have any identity maybe that's that's connected um, right now or synced between configman and Intune slash Azure. Uh, so you can generate a bulk token and that bulk token can be used as the initial communication. Uh, so there's there's some parameters you can use when you do a configuration manager client install. And during that install, uh, it uses the token, which has a, a short lifetime. I think it defaults to three days. Um, you use that token, you do your install. The configman client reaches out to your CMG, gets proxied on through, and it says, hey, look, I know that you're you're valid, right? You've got a token. Um, and then it will kick back a fresh token and say, well, here's your unique token uh, now that I know, you know you're, you're valid. So then you can kind of start that back and forth conversation. You know, you can now get a configman client out there on the internet. Uh, it can start talking back and doing all those supported scenarios. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think yeah. you might show this in the lab as well. So I'm not going to yeah. sit on this slide, but this is useful as a takeaway slide as well on how to generate that bulk token mm -hmm. to use in your CCM setup command line. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> ha -ha, this is the fun part. Yeah. Before we move into the labs, we just want to share some common misconfigurations we see. So we're not expecting you to go away today from watching this first part of the webinar and set up a CMG and it's all shiny and lovely. You need to do your homework. Um, read the Microsoft documentation, do some planning around it, understand what you're setting up, absolutely. Um, but while you're doing that, these are some of the things that we've come across before um, that might trip you up. So we thought we'd share them with you. So one of the things was if, if you're new to Azure and you're just on your cloud journey and you maybe haven't really set much up in your Azure subscription yet, when you come to set up the CMG, you need to make sure these resource providers are enabled on the subscription that you choose. Otherwise, your CMG won't deploy. So. Yeah, this one got me in my lab set up. Uh, and, and the error was relatively obvious. Uh, it'll tell you like, hey, I cannot allocate this resource. Uh, kind of funny though, after a couple of retries, it was able to create the key vault, but it never got past that. So uh, mm. definitely a, a good one to be aware of. Yeah, we saw it when we tried it, it would, it would create it. It would show that it was attempting it, then it created it, then it wasn't there. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. what's going on? Um, did somebody not pay the bill on the credit card or something? <laughs> but yeah, that was the reason. Okay, next one. Uh, I think we'd we beat this one to death. Earlier. Yeah, valid namespace. Definitely check that the namespace is valid before you go and order a public certificate um, when you're considering that DNS name. So yep. go and check in Azure, go and add a public IP address, but just go through the motion. Don't actually add it, um, but going through the motion will tell you whether that name is available and make sure that yeah. name is available for public IP address, key vault and storage account. They need to be unique. Otherwise, your um, CMG deployment will fail. <clears throat> And then I think uh, this one's kind of interesting. So uh, this one and the next slide both touch on client settings that are, um, you know, uh, good things to know for for the CMG uh, or related components. So uh, you can actually dictate whether or not a client can even use a CMG or a CDP. Uh, and I will say the bottom one, allow access to cloud distribution point. Uh, that does, as far as I'm aware, also mean content hosted on the for the CMG. Uh, does, yeah. So just because it says Cloud DP and you're saying I don't have one, that's content on a CMG too. Uh, 
Um, but uh, yeah. these checkboxes to me are interesting because there are scenarios where you don't want certain resources or business sectors to even be able to use your CMG, right? Um, you know, business spending can be very complicated. Uh, and they are allowing you to start getting granular and start dictating who can and cannot use these cloud resources, uh, at least to some extent. So make sure you turn these on if you want your devices to be able to even use a CMG and get that distributed out to whatever clients need it. Yeah, spot on. And it, come, it comes down to that planning piece again. Like <clears throat> if you if you were using the CMG for internal clients, like in the DMZ, or you had a reason for your internal clients to use a CMG for content and not a distribution point, um, then you need to make sure as you're planning that and you're planning your boundaries and you're deciding whether you want to add the CMG um, into a boundary, then make sure that you're also considering how these client settings are being um, assigned to your devices as well. You know? Yeah, for sure. And then uh, the next slide, I believe, uh, another fun one. So this one, it's kind of gone back and forth in terms of being problematic and not, but in its current state, it's definitely problematic for third-party patching specifically. So within the software update section, uh, there is a, a um, Delta content option. Um, I think it's actually the checkbox two above where the arrow is pointing. Um, I think the arrow slipped. So yeah. Gravity here in Europe is heavier than in the US. <laughs> so, but uh, <laughs> allow clients to download Delta content when the uh, option is available. So if that's set to yes and you have third party patches, uh, it can kind of fall over and it can cause some issues with uh, third party patching specifically. Um, so if you're using over a CMG, so if you've got a CMG and you're doing third party patching and you're hosting that content on the CMG, this checkbox can definitely cause you a little bit of headache. Um, so something to keep in mind. Definitely, definitely. Okay, uh, so the next one that we see, uh, the software update point should be configured to allow CMG traffic. Um, yep. So if you're following the docs and you're planning this stuff carefully, you, you would have read this, but this does get missed. Um, on the software update point properties, make sure you tick the box to allow configuration manager gateway traffic to that software update point. Um, if you don't do that, you will you will not be able to download third party updates um, by your CMG. Because as we said earlier, the software update point is where you get content for your Microsoft updates and your third party updates. But when your clients are communicating via a CMG, um, really we're talking about third party updates coming from the SUP. Um, Microsoft updates will come from the CDN. So they'll come down that local branch internet connection um, for your devices. Uh, we yeah. certainly don't recommend distributing Microsoft Update content to your CMG. There's just there's no need. There's no value in doing that. Um, but third party update content um, is not widely distributed across uh, CDN in the cloud somewhere. You know, it's something that's unique and specific to each customer. Um, so that data does have to come from your sub. Yeah, for sure. And I believe the next one addresses the other part of this, and that is that checkbox right there on your management point. Uh, same checkbox, similar concept. Um, you know, so you can actually dictate, really, if you want, you can actually uncheck this for certain MPs, for example. Um, if maybe you have some reason to do that, maybe it's even a firewall reason, right? You yeah. may have some MPs that are firewalled off and aren't going to have any access to the internet. Um, might as well leave the box unchecked. No point in in you know creating those connections. Um, and that above that, there is the HTTPS and HTTP uh, radio buttons. Um, this is kind of a, an additional gotcha in this one. Um, if you are EHTTP, you do need it set to HTTP up top. Um, so don't let it fool you. Um, the HTTP is like, <laughs> leave it HTTP. I, I totally fat fingered that one in my lab and it cost me some, some fun little issues. Yeah, your client comms will be rejected by the management point because it's expecting a client certificate at that point. For sure. PKI. OK, um, <clears throat> this is cool. So when we were testing CMG, um, we have lab environments on the internal network. And so I wanted to just tell my client that it was on the Internet. Um, as, as your client moves from an internal network associated with a boundary um, to the Internet, uh, the config manager client is aware of that change most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, generally, if you change the network the client is on, uh, that would invoke a client location lookup. You know, have I changed? Do I need to be talking to somewhere different now? Different management point. 
if you restart the SMS agent service or reboot the machine, that would invoke a client location lookup on restart. Um, but you can use some WMI to do this as well, or force yeah. the registry. Uh, there's a couple of options there. So we could actually set a registry key under HD Local Machines Software Microsoft CCM Security. Client always on the internet. If you set that to one, um, it will always be on the internet and it will always try to look out for that CMD first if there is one configured in your environment. Um, yeah, if, if when you change network and you're looking at your location logs, um, you don't see it changed to internet from intranet. Cody found this really cool, uh, actually found he knew it, this really cool um, WMI class to trigger to force a client location lookup. Yeah. So there's uh, the trigger schedule uh, method. So it's on the SMS client. Uh, we have the link in the slides. It's also the bottom there. There's a big list. So this is how you can trigger those machine policy refreshes. And this one I think is ref refresh default MP, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so without restarting CCM exec or your client, you can uh, kind of force a switch over to evaluate, hey, like I need to talk to the internet. Um, it's pretty useful. Yeah. Or so vice versa. We're not saying go and do this for any client that's going to communicate over a CMG. Just use this for your testing. You know, if you just want to force a location or you want to force a location request change, then do this. Yeah. Because sometimes when we were testing, it was useful to maybe watch the client sitting on the intranet, so it's internal infrastructure, downloading content, and then we switch it across to the internet and then watch it change its management point to the CMG. And we'll show that in the live lab in a sec. Yeah. And then I believe the last fun bit here is uh, distribute content. You know, it 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 is a distribution point. It will show up as a distribution point. Uh, if you want something to be able to access it from the CMG, from the cloud, from you know away from your site, then it's got to be out there. Um, the thing to keep in mind: you will pay for egress cost. So it will not cost you money to upload content to this. It will cost you money when your clients request and download the content from your CMG. Your cloud distribution point component of it. Um, so uh, with that cost, that egress cost in mind, you do not need to distribute Microsoft updates. That's something we've mentioned. You will need to distribute third party updates um, and then any apps that you want out there, et cetera. So just distribute your content. Defo. Awesome. So that, there, yeah, there are some good gotchas we see often. Um, so that's the slide heavy done. We were going to jump into the labs now. Um, Unless there was like a, a couple of questions we want to pick up before we do that. Uh, has anything jumped out in the chat? I know there's at least, uh, maybe we try to do a couple of hand raises. Um, I think there's three people with their hand raised. If there's still a question, if one of you wants to come off mute, uh, fire away. If you have um, EHTTP enabled on the site and you have an internal uh, PKI, but the, the CRL list isn't published, and the certificate is uploaded. Um, would EHTP still be used? Like, can you still authenticate with the Azure AD, or would it always just default to PKI? And no noting that that the we don't have it set to the ratio button's not set to HTTPS. Uh, it depends. So if you have um, it, yeah, that it's going to really depend on on various bits of configuration there. Honestly, it, it, there's a potential that you'd see clients using both. Honestly, um, if you've got like your PKI cert up there on there on your CMG, if you've got the client cert and chain set, um, if your clients have a PKI issued cert, I mean, there's a few considerations. It's hard to give you a yes no answer there. Yeah, okay. certainly in part of the communication. If if you have a PKI certificate present on the client, there are instances where it will prefer to use that than use mm -hmm. something like uh, an Azure AD token. Um, yeah, so that sounds like a bit of a complex scenario. Um, are you, do you have HTTPS and PKI? Are you looking to move to HTTP? Is, is that um, what you're trying to do no. at the moment? They have had HTTP for a while and they don't want to move to HTTPS. Okay. So we did EHTTP, but okay. the PKI cert and then a couple other PKI certs are uploaded. So I didn't know if that would be 
nullify the 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 fact that we have eHGDP enabled? Yeah, if you're uploading certificates, um, so we're talking about the CMG properties within Config Man. Any root certificate there, you're saying, I trust. If the client yep. has a certificate um, that comes from this chain, then I trust it to communicate with the management point. That's essentially what it's doing at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, so the fact that you've uploaded the certificate there doesn't mean it's going to force its hand. It kind of depends on what you've got figured at the site level. Um, on what kind of communication is going to be used. Yeah, you may want to play with the client and, you know, remove its PKI cert, see what it does. Um, you can dig into some of the logs and see what it's actually using in some cases. I'll show you what it looks like when it's using an Azure AD token, for example. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Cool, no worries. Um, oof, we've got 22 minutes left, I think. How much, uh, uh, how fast are labs. you? Oh, okay, I'm good. I'm good, let's go. And we can try to also touch on some yeah, questions hi, at the end as well. Here. So, uh, uh, can you Yep. Yeah. Uh, if devices are co-managed, then does it require to change the settings in client, uh, SSM client setting if the devices are in co-managed state? So I think so, you just broke up. Did you catch that, Cody? Uh, maybe. So, I mean, uh, like, are you talking the client settings to like enable CMG access if they're co-managed, or what do you mean? Yes, yes, exactly. If the devices okay. are in co-managed state, then does it require to change client setting in SCCM? Uh, yes. So, even if it's co-managed, you still need to set the configs to say this can access a CMG if you want <laughs> them to access the CMG. Co-management and accessing a CMG are kind of two two separate concepts. Um, yeah. So, any configs you need for a CMG are still going to be in place uh, and required, even if you have a, a co-management. Yep. Yeah, join next month, February, we're doing a webinar on co-management. So we'll talk about workloads and maybe yep. do you want to consider moving like your third party updates out to in June? So we're going to cover all that good stuff next month as well in a bit more detail. Um, so just I jumping into the Yeah, you're welcome. No problem at all. Um, so I've just jumped across to I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to speed talk. Um, <laughs> this is a client I have in my lab. Um, so I've just opened up some common log files that we would typically use. And I just want to show you the communication that's going on. OK, so I've fixed this client to use um, to be forced onto Internet. So if I open up Config Manager, I can see that the connection type here is set to always use Internet. OK. So my client is going to prefer to use a CMG here. <clears throat> if I go to Software Center, I've got some apps. So let me just double check what I've got installed already. So I've got 7-zip 22 installed here. And I've got Google Chrome. Let's make this a bit bigger. Okay, so 7-zip version 22. And I've got Google Chrome version 92. So really old version of Google Chrome. Um, I don't have Notepad++ installed. So the first thing I'm going to do is from apps, I'm going to install Notepad++. And I can see if I jump across the config, man, it's very simple. I've got a an application in here for 7-zip version 2.2 to all systems. And that is what my client can see. So if I try and install Notepad++ and just see what's going on in the logs. So what my client is doing now is saying, OK, I've already received the policy to say that this application is available to me. And now the user wants to download it. So I need to understand where to get this content from. Yeah. So we're going to look in the cas.log first. And you can see it's found a distribution point. Well, it's actually found the CMG as a distribution point, which is cool. So we've received the request for the content. We're going to download the content from the distribution point. Good. That kind of happened before we could blink. So we installed the app. Now what I want to do is <clears throat> I installed an old version. So I installed version 8.44 of Notepad++. So if I just do a refresh in here, 8.44. I know there's an update available um, that I've published through Patch My PC. 
So what I want to do now is just do a quick software update scan cycle. So what this will do, this is now going to communicate um, via the CMG to my WSS instance on-prem, so my software update point. And I may not see in the log file here that it's actually connecting to the software update point because it did it earlier. Um, but I can certainly see the results coming back in the update store log. I can see I'm missing the update for 7-zip-2201 and Google Chrome version 109. So let's just scroll down the log file a bit further. OK, and when I did my software update scan just now, because I'd installed an older version of Notepad++ 8.44, um, it's now found that update for me. So I've now got an update available for Chrome 7-zip and Notepad++ as well. One thing that just came to mind too, it's kind of fun, is the, the software update point um, is actually uh, 100% HTTP here. It's not eHttp or anything. Uh, there is no HTTPS required to expose your SUP and WSUS via a CMG. Uh, it's all HTTP uh, over CMG and internet. It's all HTTP. So there's no crazy changes that need to happen there. Just that checkbox on the SUP role to allow use on CMG. Yeah, it's a great show. Oh. So I'm just going to do another simple example here. So I've got some updates available now. So maybe I just want to go ahead and install these updates. So same kind of thing again, we can see it's going to do a content request for the update I've just chosen to download. And again, that request has come via, if I get the key combination right. So this is the distribution point it's choosing. So it's coming from the CMG. And it's going to pull that content down. So you can see at this point, it's really important to make sure your content is distributed correctly. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to get the content coming down. So this looks good. So we'll just wait for that to install. 2201 is installed. Awesome. <clears throat> so there's not really, from the client's perspective, um, yes, I've configured the CMG, and the client knows it's on the internet. It knows it has a CMG. If I go open up the client properties, and you can probably see this in the registry as well. If I look at the network tab, you can see it's received the policy that it has a CMG um, associated with it. Um, so it just happens, smoke and mirrors. Instead of scanning WSUS with the local URL that you would normally um, see on the client in the registry, um, it's done that translation. So the scan that happens via the CMG to WSUS. The content requests comes via the CMG uh, to the software update point and the distribution point. So boil it all down, and it's just literally a proxy service in the cloud. Yeah, for sure. I think that's all I wanted to show. Do you want to share your screens? You yeah. found some cool stuff in your lab as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, one thing definitely I wanted to show was how I got my client installed. So we can see that when I open up my control panel applet, I do have self-signed for my client certificate, uh, which is awesome. And I have connection type of always internet. So we touched on that. There's a couple of ways to get to always internet. I'll show you how I did mine. Um, and then, you know, I'm connected to my site. There it is. It's magic. You know, um, I've, I've actually got that all set up, which is great. And there's my internet based management point. Uh, so the way I got myself installed here, this device is, you know, internet born. It's, it's like you took it out of the box kind of thing. It's never seen the site. It's never talked to configuration manager in its life. Uh, so on the config man side, we did a bulk registration, registration token creation. So if I were to run this command. So here's bulk registration token, uh, and you can do a slash new. Uh, and then on top of slash new, it defaults to three days. If you want, you can do a lifetime. Uh, so here, for example, is a token that is good for one minute. Uh, so yeah, uh, if you're quick, uh, but there you go. Here's an example of making a token. I would copy paste this. And then I actually, in my case, I just stored it in text document. Um, here's a token that was good for three days, and I'm just calling CCM setup. This is the only file you need. Uh, the docs call that out. You don't need the cab. You don't need the MSI. You don't need anything at all except a um, at least a, I don't even remember the version. I'd have to check the docs. You need a new enough version of CCM dot, you know, CCM setup dot where it recognizes uh, the reg token parameter. 
Uh, aside from that, you pass in the management point. In this case, it's going to be the um, CMG and then the host name. Do not include HTTPS here. It will cause problems. Your site code, the token, and depending on your config and what you're doing, in my case, no CRL check. Um, this is because I just don't have one and nothing's in place. And then this is that always internet parameter. Um, this right here, it's not always the most obvious thing to get anymore. Uh, the way I get it, and I think this is in the slide deck as well. Um, if you have a, any machine that can see the CMG, um, you can run this command. I'm just running it on my site server. Uh, it just grabs it out of WMI. You can grab, really all this does is grab your active management point candidates, and in this case say, hey, you know what, is it internet? And I grab the list. So that's what I'm using to grab that. And I, that was it. This got me uh, on, I'm connected, everything is happy. Uh, I can now talk to Configuration Manager. Everything started to, to work quite well. It's self-signed, you know, it's not PKI based. I do not have a, a client authentication certificate uh, from the PKI. Uh, this is all Azure AD based authentication. Uh, one thing I will mention, because my CMG is using a PKI issued self-signed cert, or not self-signed, PKI issued cert, I had to establish this trust, right? Um, this is not a requirement if you're using a public cert on your CMG, but it's a requirement because I use a PKI issued one. Um, this can go away if you're using a public cert, mm -hmm. and then you're really kind of in a no PKI infrastructure at all scenario. So that's why my one barrier uh, there. Uh, and then aside from that, one thing I thought was really neat that I wanted to show was the actual token request that happens. So uh, once you do have that kind of connection in place, we can actually see the token requests happening in the CCM underscore STS log. Uh, so that is one of the components that kind of comes along with all of this is the uh, STS component right here uh, and the on your management point. You know, uh, so the CMG ends up forwarding these certain types of requests for you know, tokens and such off to this STS component right here. And then we can actually see validated AAD token, uh, token type, tenant ID. So this is actually my tenant ID. And we can also see this is my user ID. And then we can even see the device ID. Uh, so all of that information, it says, hey, that's all good. Uh, it creates an SCCM token and then it sends it back to the client. So that's that conversation where I made the request on the client and said, hey, I need a token. Uh, this is the info I have. I know I'm me. Uh, config man says, oh, look, you are you. Here's all the information. Everything meshes. Uh, and I actually have this bits and pieces pulled up on this side. So I have my uh, system discovery table and I have my device right here. Nope, here. So. We can see I've got the AAD device ID of AFAC. Here it is, right? This is in config man. Uh, we have the device actually showing up, demo to Intune. Here it is in Intune. And similarly, I have my users. So here is the AAD tenant ID. Here is the AAD user ID. Uh, and specifically, it's this one right here. And if we go look at that log, those both line up with this. Here's the user ID and then the uh, device ID, those those all line up and, and everything kind of just walks through. It's it's very, very convenient. It just kind of works. Um, and then the only other thing I think I really wanted to show, uh, just because I had expanded this out, uh, when we do a content request, because uh, I do have, you know, I've got updates available here too. I just um, have to retry them here. I'm on a CMG. I don't have um, any PKI certs in terms of being a client. I'm an Azure AD user that is logged in right now. Um, you know, it's all it, so it's a pretty awesome scenario, right? It's very cloud oriented. And when I do a content request, um, and this would happen in his scenario as well that he had set up, one of the things you'll see when you do a content request is this use Azure. Uh, so there is the ability to say, oh, look, you know, I, I specifically am allowing Azure based resources in this content request. Uh, and you can see a few other things. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of components to a, a client uh, request. I and mean, here's use Internet DP is also allowed. And then DP token auth, right? So these location requests 
Um, this kind of boils down to like someone's like, well, what if I have A and B configured? Well, it really depends. That's going to start to change your location request. It's going to start to change the, the things you send off to your MP. And, and based on all of these little configs, you're going to get different things sent back to you. Um, so in my case, you know, I'm, um, I'm actually in a boundary for um, my distribution point, but it doesn't even come back as a response based on my configuration. So it depends. There's just a huge red asterisk of it depends with this stuff. Um, that's so that's yeah. really cool. Just on the no, that's really cool stuff. Uh, just on the point around the config manager client installation, I haven't tried mm -hmm. this, um, but you can install the config manager agent from Intune now. So you, you don't even need to to give it a CCM client or CCM setup boxy, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you've got access to endpoint.microsoft.com there, Cody. If I you all have. do, but I don't you need cloud attached to do it? I think that might be the prereq. Or is it not? I think it's cloud attached that lets you do that. If you go. Doo, 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 doo. So under uh, enro enrollment, so devices. Oh, go devices. Enroll, enroll devices. Mm -hmm. Okay. So under co-management settings. So designed for co-management scenarios, but you can enroll, you can install the config manager client this way and specify your CMG parameters here as well. So that as it's going through kind of onboarding, so if you're in that cloud first, first scenario, your devices are being born on the internet, um, then this will install the config manager agent with the argument you specify. Now, I don't know, I haven't tested this first hand on how that would work, but it looks like it's pretty good. Good to go. Yeah, that's definitely a good one to, to call out. This was not Just, a scenario we walked through right now. No, but the only thing to be careful of, like Cody showed you, that bulk registration token has a short lifetime. So mm -hmm. don't expect to save the config up in there and it just works forever. Um, so it's just something to consider. Awesome. Cool. Um, and... We have a ton of stuff we could jump into to demo. I, I wanted to show you how you could access um, the CMG up in the cloud. Um, maybe ping me. If you want to see that, and I can give you share some secrets. So, because it's a proxy service and a Windows device, you can access it. You can RDP to it. Um, you have to jump through a few loop hoops first, but that is possible. And I just find that kind of thing interesting. So, I can go to the CMG. Um, it's running IIS for that reverse proxy service. I can look at the bindings for the certificate. I can look at the IIS logs. Um, so, it's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to know to do that, just reach out and I can share some information. I don't think we're going to have time on this webinar now. Yeah, I don't um, think so. Do we that. did do it during our setups to do some troubleshooting because, like I said, mine was not working. Um, you know, I missed some some bits and pieces and we totally we logged into the VM that hosts it. Um, oh, one thing I did want to mention just because I remembered that I did it. Um, we did mention you can do more than one instance. And while I'm here, I will show that. So this is the virtual machine scale set that got created by Configuration Manager. It manages this. It created two instances. I told it to do this uh, just before. I actually had one, and then I live changed it to two uh, just before the meeting, and fingers crossed. And sure enough, it worked. I now have two instances. And uh, one small thing you can note, there's the bit here. We can see you know, it kind of truncates the name a little bit, uh, it looks, and then it just dumps a bunch of numbers at the end. This actually maps to a couple of log files. So I now have two log files on my site server, uh, and they both are named after the, the, the VMs. So I now have two dash CMG cool. services uh, log files, and these equate to the two machines. Uh, I, I want to say these, uh, they're, they're synced. These are not live. If I'm not mistaken, these are um, like, there, there's an occasional sync, if I remember correctly. Yeah, there's there's um, a heartbeat monitor between the two services. Yeah. And while you're here, while you're here, you can actually show the, um, just as we come to wrap up um, and some further thinking, if, if you're able to show the in Config Manager console, the CMG properties, you do get some statistics for your CMG in the console as well. So you can, um, we're going to talk about costs in a second, but you can do some cost analysis and budgeting on this mm -hmm. stuff in, in Azure if you're concerned about how much it's going to cost. And it really isn't that much, but you do get some of those metrics on that monitor service coming through into the config man console, like how much data um, your clients are requesting. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. That's pretty useful so to see. We can see those right here, actually. Um, so, yep, we've got total response size, 
in the last 30 days, very small. Um, so depending on what you're doing, it, it can be pretty minimal cost. I think in the Q&A, there was a question about cost. Uh, there is a like real life CMG costs article that has a bunch of people that submitted real life scenarios, this many clients, et cetera. Um, and you can start to see the costs. Um, it, you know, affordable is a relative term, but it's not too bad. Yeah, I'll just share it quickly for those who are screenshotting as we come to wrap up the webinar. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm not a PowerPoint guru, so it's just start the slide again. So I'm just going to jump right to the pack. Um, yeah. <clears throat> a, yeah, a couple of call out slides quickly. So here's some take a screenshot. These are good log files. Um, we will share these decks as well. These are some good log files to look at once you've got the CMG set up and you're understanding what's going on. Um, but in terms of costs, Johan um, did a really amazing article on the cost for the CMG because it was like a new thing at the time. People weren't really sure how much it was going to cost. It really doesn't cost that much. You're only paying for data egress. So the content that your clients are requesting from the CAS, that's going to be the cost you'll see. Any any content being distributed um, to the CMG um, is ingress and that's free of charge into Azure. Yeah. So that that egress, might have a bear yeah egress costs only so includes policy i think is worth noting right so i i think of it because somebody actually specified mm -hmm. oh hourly power power uh hourly policy refresh and weekly hardware software inventory um policy is content mm -hmm. uh, that will that does cost money um but you know something to keep in mind absolutely and i think when we're doing talking before the webinar as well if, if you do like certificate revocation checking that is data coming backwards and forwards so there's a cost associated to that because it's more mm -hmm. data so it's it's not a huge cost of, um but it's something to bear in mind like what content am i distributing what third party updates am i distributing to my cmg could i be using intune instead um instead of the cmg you know so should i be thinking about moving update workloads with third party updates to intune natively um yeah awesome We'll maybe talk a bit more on that as well when we look at code management uh, in February.